Good evening, my name is Dr. Rory Deverell. I'm a Commodity Risk Manager with INTL FC Stone. Uh, what I'm about to debate with you here today has accompanying slides. If you would like to have that, those slides, if you're a customer, you already have them. If you don't have them, reach out to me at rory.deverell at intlfcstone.com and I will send them on to you. Now, as we begin our journey through this debate, uh, we have to acknowledge that as we move into the new harvest, uh, new marketing year, 1819, for the crop that's going to be harvested in a few weeks' time, starting uh, in a few weeks' time in, in, in Southern Europe and North Africa and parts of the US, we need to start to channel our ideas on when it comes to production. So, what I mean by that, we have to obviously take a big picture, big world view of, of new crop supply. But we can concentrate our thinking down to a few key producers which ultimately, historically at least, have defined wheat prices. It's ourselves here in Europe, in particular France, uh, the US, Argentina, Australia and Russia. You take those countries together, in large part they define wheat prices and where we're going to go from here. So that's where we're concentrating our interest today. And even within that, we can concentrate right now today on a discussion around Russia. And I think that's relevant given they have the greatest yield variability of all the origins, and they're the ones arguably starting to move towards yield detrimental weather conditions. We've already got some uncertainty or anxiety coming into the market in the US, where you've seen a an early rise in wheat prices that we'll see later on in some of the later slides, but the market ultimately couldn't sustain that rally. Everywhere else was ultimately looking too okay. Now, the anxiety is starting to build back into the market as we look forward, and that's a concentrated in, concentration of interest, in part in Australia, where we're not really going to talk about today because, in my opinion, it's way too early to start really writing off that crop. The US here are 24 million tonnes. Do we have the opportunity still with this dry start? Remember, it's a winter wheat crop with a lot of growing ahead of it. Yeah, we can achieve that. Can we achieve higher yields? Yes, we can achieve higher yields in overall production. And can it be hugely catastrophically lower? It's Australia, of course it can. But for, day, for today, we're gonna to concentrate a conversation around Russia. Now, in the first slide, you'll see that we've broken out the Russian temperature profile into the winter and the summer. Now, this winter, has been benign. There's almost no instance of winter kill. It was like a Western European winter. So that's yield positive, and we have to factor that in to a positive new crop supply outlook. A great start. That, our great winter. We got through the winter okay. Now, as we move forward, uh, March, again, accumulated really nice levels of rainfall. Positive start. But the story is starting to change. April, very dry as you can see in the next slide and the slide after it. I have to use my toe to move us forward here so bear with me. Now you can see very clearly March was good. April was really low levels of rainfall, way below average. In fact it was below 2010 and 2012, don't tell anybody. And May is turning out to be much drier as well. Where we're different to 2010 and 12 is what's in the soil at the, going into it and the temperature file profile. It's been quite cool so we can't really worry too much we can't write off this crop it's not been hot enough to really damage the crop and we're trying to figure out how much that soil in the ground is going to help get through this uh, dry uh, low level of rainfall window that we find ourselves in but it has to start becoming this is six to seven weeks now of this very low levels of rainfall. We have to start factoring that into our production ideas and already uh, the trade is starting to pull back. I think if we put a few numbers in our head, 85 million tonnes where we were last year, I don't think that's very achievable. I don't think really anybody realistically does. So that high water mark is not going to happen next year in all probability. So we start to say, well, what other water marks do we have? The USDA are at 72 million tonnes. When that was first released at the start of May, that was completely, it seemed unrealistically low. It's the USDA being its usual conservative self, even though it's a few million tons above where they started the previous year. Now, that number is actually starting to become more and more realistic and more and more talked about. 
and already some of the private analysts are moving their numbers back into the mid and even the low 70 million tonnes. Can we get to low, below 70 million tonnes, that psychologically important level? Interestingly, the USDA are using 26 million hectares of wheat. That's 1 million hectares or so less than the year before. Now, if we apply, uh, many would debate that number. So let's pull it back up to 27 million hectares. And if we apply uh, the yield, uh, the deviation from trend yield over previous years to that 27 million hectare number, then of course, best case scenario like last year, we can get back to 85. We've written that off already. But any of the sub-trend yields, you apply those uh, sub-trends to the existing trend, you don't get to 70 million tonnes. I think we really need to think hard about Russia producing less than 70 million tonnes if this dry weather pattern that we're experiencing excuse me, in southern Russia persists. We have to marry that as well to the very late plantings of spring wheat in Russia and what that means for, means for yield, yield potential. We have a uh, crop of spring barley just across the road and that we were, we're a month late on that. We cannot accept or expect the same level of yields as a normal yield year when we grow the, plant the crop a month later. We can't expect the same for Russia. So we really do need to think about realistic production numbers. And I think it's more realistic to be closer to 70 million tonnes than it is to be towards 80 million tonnes. And that takes quite a bit of supply out of the new crop, especially when you factor in as well. The Russians have taken their bumper crop, but they haven't transferred that into big surpluses to carry them through a year where they produce less than the year before. They don't have that big surplus because they've had a huge export program and they've expanded their own domestic consumption. We have to take a big picture supply outlook for Russia into consideration. Now, part of what uh, the story is outside of this Russian production story is, of course, the currency. Now, the euro has been really quite weak over the last month to six weeks. And by extension, or trans uh, in relation to that, is, of course, that the dollar has been strong. So, despite this strong dollar, what's really interesting is... Chicago prices are going up and Black Sea White prices in US dollars are going up as well. The market clearly sees some sort of a supply issue or some reason to buy into this. Now, part of it is, of course, the fund positioning, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. But we do need to factor in the implications and the headwind that the strong dollar presents to prices in dollar terms and the support that it can bring to prices in euro terms. So as we move on to the next slide, what we're looking at here is coming back to this big picture where we're pulling back in all our um, big, um, our main uh, wheat producers and exporters. And you can see that last year was a year of really big production and associated lower prices with it. Of course, we were lower in previous years, but we're in that range of low prices well below $200 a tonne. Now as we move prices in the FOB markets back towards $200 and above, it's starting to reflect this lower level of production that's coming down the tracks. Now in this model, we're modeling in from hypothetical scenario where as we look at each individual supply or wheat producer on their own, this is, this is here we are in Western Europe. This is not uncommon of what you would see in Western and Southern Germany, France, even parts of Spain would look as good as this. They're getting much closer to the harvest. So Western Europe, France has been very successful when it comes to this window of the last six weeks. So we can start to argue up production ideas there. And France, if we take that as the centerpiece of wheat production here of Europe, probably they have a very good opportunity to reach or exceed last year's wheat production numbers. So let's add that to our model. Let's add a million tons to French wheat production in our model. Now, we move on to Russia. USDA is 72 million tons. Let's hit this crop and we're gonna pull it back to 70 million tons and see how that uh, fares for us. The US, we're gonna match it in around last year's production numbers, just not 
going straight forward. Of course, we have a bit of opportunity with the spring wheat crop to recover things, but the winter wheat crops, especially around Kansas, have been disappointing when it comes to weather conditions. And we can't be too optimistic there. Argentina, record planted area. Let's bump up production there a little bit above the USDA. And let's be nasty on Australia and we'll pull back production there. So you take these all together and you get a price around the 210, 220 level as being fair value for December wheat prices. That's very much where we find our today, ourselves today. So in this context, we could consider that today's wheat prices are really a fair reflection of this maybe more pessimistic production outlook than, the, than has been presented either by the trade as a whole or even the USDA. Now, as we mentioned, the price, the chart that you're looking at now is uh, looking historically at a few price references, European prices, US prices and Black Sea prices. So you can see very clearly we've got that initial bump in prices. We've been here before. These prices that we find ourselves today at, we've been here before only a month ago. And we have to ask ourselves the question, have things improved or disimproved versus four weeks ago? Arguably, they've got worse. So we can probably anticipate some short-term support to the market to be maintained on this declining production outlook as it's been presented to us today. Of course, we see a change in the weather patterns. What we're looking for is a main continuous cool weather in, in, uh, in Russia and the addition of some widespread rains in southern Russia and across the spring wheat area. That changes the production outlook very quickly and we need to, that's what we're looking for. But until that difference comes, then we need to think that the funds, as you see in the next chart, again, we've been here, not last month, but last year. Last year, we saw a big covering of the short all the way up to a long. They don't like to be long on wheat, but they got themselves up there on some anxiety by the month of July. Of course, that anxiety was unfounded and they gave up their position and went back to a short and the market had to follow that trajectory of fund selling. Will it work out to the, this, this time again? Well, in all probability it will. If you look historically, especially recent history of the four or five years, it's not uncommon to get these price rises as you can see in this uh, inflection chart uh, slide. So we've seen these 5, 10, 15 euro moves to the upside in this window. We shouldn't be hugely surprised that it's coming again because it basically comes almost every year. Now, what almost comes every year of the last five is a pull down of prices and again we wouldn't like to bet against that probability so we need to decide what position and what's our view what's our short-term vision probably a bit of a push to the upside what's the long-term probability probably harvest pressure will come in to pull us lower how we want to position ourselves needs to be the key question we ask ourselves today i think that question is a little bit different for consumers and producers. You can see here clearly that statistically you pull out this window of grain fill, it's a terrible time for consumers to lock in their uh, prices. Statistically, the odds are against you that this window of grain filling is going to be the window where you achieve your best prices. You either want to have done your 20 or 30% already or you wait until much closer to new crop positions to take your position in the marketplace not a good position and that's why maybe we're seeing so much of the trade flow from our risk management perspective on the producer side because statistically again this window is actually a really good opportunity for producers to get uh, some selling on the books taking advantage of this anxiety coming into the market sometimes it turns into well-founded anxiety and we keep pushing higher more commonly, especially in the last four to five years, this sort of a price move in this window is usually unfounded anxiety and we ultimately end up pulling lower. That's been the typical trend. We'll see how this year pans out. In terms of relative values, we're looking here at the spread between Matif and Chicago. Usually Matif is a premium. Usually that premium is 20 to $30 a tonne. Usually that premium actually finds its low around here and then 
as we progress forward, Matif finds his premium once again as the US harvest comes in and pulls that price lower. This year we need to reflect two things. Two things. One, the currency, the weak euro helps to pressure uh, your uh, French wheat values, European wheat values, and tends to support US prices. So that's part of the reason why this gap has closed. Second thing, you look at how the two crops are performing. As I mentioned, there's nothing wrong with this crop. This is reflected of Western Europe, including France. You look at the US crops, much more disappointing. Hence, pressure on French Matif values and the support on Chicago and Kansas values. Final point I want to make, volatility. There's a volatility spread in the market as well. US futures, Kansas, Chicago. Volatility on the options market is trading around 30% or more. Option volatility on Matif is trading around 15, 16%. Almost twice the volatility in the option markets in Chicago than there is in Matif. When it comes to hedging and risk management, we need to think about what that means for us. Does this spread have an implication for us in the positions we take? between Matif and Chicago on a flat price perspective. Matif is arguably cheap relative to Chicago. Volatility is arguably expensive in Chicago relative to Matif. Can we build risk management strategies around that? We've been doing that and we've been trying to build ideas and debate around our customers around that idea. So really, I wanna leave it here to say that I'm not gonna call the Russian wheat crop today. It is going to be the key thing going forward at this point because the one that's showing the, the, the greatest level of uncertainty. Is it gonna match last year? No. Are we gonna break 80 million tons? Highly unlikely. Are we gonna be somewhere above 70? Probably. Can we go below 70? Absolutely. We need to start to position ourselves according to this wide supply variability that's facing us today and positioning ourselves accordingly. I'd love to debate this with you. Please send me an email if you would like the slides and you don't have them. Email me if you think, if you agree with anything I say, if you disagree with anything we, you, I say, it's all there for debate. Rory.deverell at intlfcstone.com. Thank you very much.